Good afternoon. This from Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. Let us pray. Lord, let your gospel come to us. Let it come with power and clarity, conviction, richly provided in the blood of Christ. And by your spirit, grow us and call us close to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you remember in grade school how they were choosing up a team on the playground? And the two biggest guys got to choose. You were one of the little runts like me. And uh, Sam, come on with us. Bruce, I'll take you. And you were just sitting there hoping, pick me, pick me. Oh, please, somebody pick me. So you wouldn't be standing alone, ashamed of yourself on the playground. And when your name was called, oh, you swelled up and stuck your chest out. You felt like you were somebody. We live in a big old lonesome world that doesn't seem to need us very much. Uh, Americans suffer from what sociologists in Chapel Hill call the accursed sense that I don't belong anywhere. And I've got good news for you. God is picking a team. And in every likelihood, he's calling your name. He called my name. And much to my surprise, long before I began to call on his name, he was calling my name. Long before I learned to love him, he was loving me. Listen to Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be God who has chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless and destined in his love to be his sons. Chosen, destined, and loved. Aren't they wonderful words? And these can be yours with real meaning as they're mine. I want to tell you my story. Now, I know it's unkind to talk about yourself. One of the cardinal rules of preaching is for every one word about me, ten words about Jesus Christ. But the Bible does say in the 107th Psalm, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I'm here to say so. Now, in Christ, there are two huge concepts. There's what your life was like before you met Jesus and what your life is like now that you've met Jesus. Or you can divide it theologically in a different way. Uh, You can divide it this way, and I like this one the best. Uh, What I was saved from and what I've been saved to. Now, I was born in a Christian home. I've never known a time when I haven't known God or the Bible or church, or the Holy Spirit, or the sacraments. I had godly parents. If a man wants to succeed in life, the first good thing you should always choose is a good set of parents. (laughs) When uh, kids on the campus accuse me of white privilege, I just say, well, I don't know if it's white or not. I think it's Christian, though, that my mom and dad loved each other and stayed together and reared their three boys. I was baptized as an infant. Now, a lot of people have a problem with that, but you need to understand we don't believe that infant baptism saves a child. It only initiates a covenant. When I was about eight years old, my dad took me down to the clothier, and there was this burgundy corduroy Sunday coat that I wanted, and he bought one for me about three sizes too large. And they rolled up the sleeves. I looked ridiculous in it. And I knew that even as an eight-year-old, but I wanted it. And I said, but but Dad, it's too big. You'll grow into it, son. And, of course, within the year, it was too small again. I understand now what he was doing. My parents put a covenant on me before I was old enough to really feel it and understand it. But in praying for me and taking me to church and modeling the Christian faith before me and telling me the stories of Jesus and encouraging me to repent and put my faith in Christ, I eventually grew in to that covenant they gave me. By age 11, I knew the Christmas story, the Easter story, the parables, half the hymn book by heart. And they had a confirmation class. Those of you that want to own your own faith and declare it publicly, 
come to this class. Well, I was the first one in there. And I remember standing up in front of the church and saying, I believe. And I meant it from the tip of my toes to the top of my head. Also, I began to experience a very nagging sense of what I call the call to be a preacher. Now, sadly, the church that I grew up in was a weak church in preaching. There wasn't good teaching in the Sunday school classes or preaching from the pulpit, and I was never taught how to live the Christian life. It's sort of like, well, now you're a Christian, you can swim out of the baptistry and make your way in the world the best you can. And so I didn't grow, and I began to move backwards. And by age 16, I had all the problems an adolescent 16-year-old would have, but I had a 12-year-old's faith. And that's a great tragedy in the world. You get your flu shot this year? You've been inoculated against the flu? They give you just enough of the real thing in a flu shot so you can't get a full-blown case of the flu. And there's a problem in the church of being inoculated. You get just enough of the religious tapestries, but you don't get the real living presence of Jesus Christ. And I turned to the world in those days for satisfaction. A state championship football team, a girl who lived in Ohio of all places, uh, wearing the right clothes, popularity. Jesus was in my life, but he was way down in my priorities. Now, Christ said, I am the bread of life. If you eat my bread, you'll never again hunger and never again thirst. Well, I miss the bread of life. And I was making the world the satisfaction for my appetite. Henry David Thoreau said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And as a 16-year-old, I was becoming increasingly desperate for meaning and relationships in my life. Imagine this afternoon if you're lost in the forest, maybe down near Sugarloaf. It's cold, the frost is probably coming. Uh, there are all kind of night sounds that are frightening. And you're without a sleeping bag, you, you don't know which way it is out of the forest, and you're afraid. And off in the distance you see a little twinkle of light, and you move there, and it's a campfire. You don't know who's built it, but you curl up around it, and it keeps the, the bugs away, and the light dispels the darkness, you're, you're warm, and you fall asleep. But you wake up some hours later, and that campfire has gone out, and you're cold again, and you're fearful again, and you look around, and in the distance you see a twinkle of light, and moving there, you find another campfire, and you're warm, and all your needs met, you fall asleep there, only to wake up a few hours later and find nothing but cold, unfeeling ashes. There are many of us that run from campfire to campfire in life, and that's what I was doing as a 16-year-old. If I can just get that girlfriend, I'll be happy. If I can just get that new outfit, I'll be happy. If I can just be popular, I'll be happy. If I can just make co-captain of the football team, I'll be happy. If we can just win the state championship, I'll be happy. About then in English class, we read a book that many fundamentalist Christians throw in the fire when they start burning books. J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Every time I hear that book condemned and burned, I get confused because that book was part of a chain that led me to a living relationship with Jesus Christ. The Catcher in the Rye is about a schoolboy who doesn't have a clue to the meaning of life. And he wanders through with great angst, searching and struggling for relationships. And I read that book and I said, my God, that's me. I don't want to grow old like that. I don't want to become like that. And it set me again on a search for Jesus Christ. And in those years, God began to strip away the idols that I adored. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament of the Philistines capturing the Ark of the Covenant and setting it up in their temple of Dagon? And in the morning they would come and, and the uh, idols of the Dagons would, would fall on their face before the Ark of the Covenant. They, they would set the God up again, and the next morning he would be broken and laying in pieces. 
at the foot of the Ark of the Covenant. All of my idols were set up in my life. And God, with his finger of mercy, began to push them over. Football, we lost the state championship. Popularity, so fickle. Women, fickle relationships, need I say more? I went to Ohio that Easter to see that girlfriend. And we went to church for no special reason, and that's just what you do. And I don't remember the preacher's name, and I don't exactly remember his text, but I remember he talked on Easter Sunday about living the resurrected life. And he said, some of you are like caterpillars crawling in the dust of the earth when God wants you to go through this metamorphosis and grow wings and become a butterfly. And I thought to myself, I am a worm crawling in the dust of life and thirsty and hungry. Lord, I want to be that butterfly. Sitting on the jet in Cincinnati, Ohio, getting ready to fly home, God asked me a question in that inner whisper of the Holy Spirit. Why not? I knew what he meant. Why not surrender to my call to preach? Put me first in your life and begin to serve me. And I gave a schoolboy's answer. Lord, I will just as soon as I get out of college because I'm going to have a lot of fun. And when I have all my fun, then I'll let you have what's left of my life. And God took his hand and swept it across the wreckage of my life. Football, girlfriends, popularity, all the idols I'd been living for. Mine was not a, a cry of a drug addict or of a prisoner. Mine was a cry of a materialist locked in a world of material values that had no room for the spiritual. And I remember saying, just as soon as, Lord, and I hardly got that out of my mind before I had a vision of all my idols falling on their face before Jesus. And I stopped and said, yes. Now, I give you my life in Christ. And I repented of my idols and sins, and I put my full trust in Christ, and I asked him to be the center of my life. I can only explain what happened to me as like a flood of peace overwhelming me. It was like I'd been living in a stuffed, hot, hot attic here in Wilmington in July when somebody opened the louvers and a fresh puff of spring, crisp, low humid air swept through. At home, I stumbled into starting a small group Bible study and looking back as a minister, I discovered what we in Reformed theology call the means of grace or the means of how Christians grow, Bible study, a worship, fellowship, the Holy Spirit sanctifying us, and even suffering and struggles. And in that Bible study, my senior year in school, over 64 different kids came. And it was way too big for a small group Bible study, so we broke it into 10 groups. I went to 10 Bible studies a week. You could tell I was going to be a minister, huh? And we began to discover the riches of prayer, the mysteries of the Holy Spirit, divine worship, love, missions, the second coming. And in those next 10 years of education, I had many wonderful mentors, J.O. Williams, Bill Glass in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Pogo Smith, Eddie West, Dr. Alan Gregg, Francis Schaefer, Dick Halverson, William Hoffman, Nobody more special than my mom and dad, but these were some of my teachers. Do we have any teachers out here today? All careers begin with teaching. And those teachers and coaches were so valuable. I was the iron, and these men were the magnet. One of the big surprises of my life is that God didn't subtract from my life. He added to it. There's a hymn we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look full into his wonderful grace, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. I can't sing that. For me, it's the opposite. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful grace, and the things of the earth will grow strangely bright. Love became lovelier. Green became greener. Truth became more truthful. I like to tell kids that um, 
I used to play marbles, and Coach Bobby Boswell came by in the eighth grade and said, you want to come out for the football team? And I said, well, I like playing marbles. Can I still play marbles if I play football? And he said, of course. But once I discovered football, I gave up childish things. Never went back to marbles. I can, I just don't want to. Now, I can look back over my life, and I could tell you about myriads of failures, the wrong ideas, the things I'm not good at, the disappointments, the rejection. But for every hurt in the Christian life, I can share 10 significant joys. One of the best is my wife, Catherine. We've been married 45 years. I told her just this morning, it seems like only 45 seconds underwater. <laughs> and she said, yeah, and I didn't know till death to his part was going to take so long. <laughs> we have three children who follow the Lord and eight grandchildren. Over the years, I've been a writer, which makes you a very secluded person, something of an introvert, but I've served six churches and the friends, the rich memories, the missions, the fun, the adventure, the people who became believers. Being a pastor is not life in the cheap seats. You get a front row seat at many of the trenchant linchpins in people's lives, conversions, baptisms, funerals, weddings. Do you know what it's like to stand this close to a bride looking into a groom's face? That's the privilege of being a minister. I tell young people all the time, if God calls you to be a preacher, don't stoop to be a king. It's a hard life. Most of my uh, collegiate life has been focused in the college world. I wrote a book for InterVarsity back in the 70s called If You Haven't Got a Prayer. It got me preaching on the college campus. And sadly, I'm one of those ministers that can't be too far from university students. Now, it's a hard life because it's night work. A duke will call me and say, we want you to come and speak on prayer. The meeting starts at 10.15. We get a pizza after that. And at my age, you know, you're thinking, what is wrong with this picture? And then after the pizza, they want you to come by the door room and talk about, are they going to get married and get to have sex before the second coming? Because, you know, in heaven, there's no sex. And they're worried about that. Being a pastor is to experience a, something of a love-hate relationship. Uh, people love you, but they hate you. There's an old rabbinical saying, if the people don't try to run the rabbi out of town, he's not much of a man, and you live in that conundrum. I want you to understand that ministry for your younger pastors is way harder than it was when I was a young man. People in our culture used to come in the door of the church here, and for this much energy, in disciple making, you could grow a Christian to hear. Now people come in the church here, and for way more than this much energy, you can sometimes grow a disciple here. Our culture is moving backwards and eroding, and it's chewing the church up and chewing the staff up. But Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. I love the honesty of that. He didn't say, he who lives and makes it look easy to the end will be saved. Nor did he say, he who waltzes through life. But he said, he who endures will be saved. I own that word. I know what it's like to endure. Over the years, I've preached in over 45 different nations, from Belarus to Zagreb. You get to go to all the garden spots of the world to preach. Some of the people in the crowds amaze me. An Air Force general... Uh, students who are the future leaders of the world, mechanics, professors, blue-collar workers. The governor was recently at a funeral that I did. Athletes. Even I had a chance recently to preach to the president of the Rotary Club of Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> when I was young, the Bible seemed to me as cool water for a thirsty soul. I'm old now and the Bible has become wine to me. And I'm not done yet, I think the best is yet to be. It's a good thing about a minister, you reach your greatest prowess as you get older, or it can work out like that. I was flying on an airplane and there was a braggart sitting next to me and I said, um, 
what's your profession, sir? I'm in big business, he said. Well, how unusual, I'm in big business too. And he said, yeah, well, I'm in business with my father. And I said, what a delight I am also. <laughs> my business is so big, it carries me all across the country. And I said, well, the business I'm in is so big, I've actually been around the world. And he said, yeah, well, you don't understand. Mine is a multi-million dollar business. And I said, oh, I, I think my business is a multi-billion dollar business. He said, just exactly what sort of business are you in? And I said, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, he gulped and turned red and looked at me and didn't say anything for a while. And then he nudged me and he wanted to talk again and he said, I think you might just be in the biggest business. I've been a pastor for 51 years. I, I'd just like to maybe give you uh, four or five stories from being a pastor. Um, Bill Kobe and Jim Abrahamson in Chapel Hill and I started a, a church called the Sunday Chapel in the Cedars, a retirement home there. Some townspeople come, even some students. But most of these are wealthy, wealthy, wealthy retired people who have a hard time getting out to church. And I told my wife, you know, it's time for me to go with, be, with people who are closer to my age. You think I'm closer to an 89-year-old or closer to a 19-year-old? You can look and, and see. That's been incredibly rewarding to, to see people who are further down the road than I am and listen to their wisdom. I've also done a lot of team chapels. In fact, I've done a stretch recently of team chapels for the University of Virginia. And I always have a, a sermon ready, but sometimes I look in the student athlete's face and uh, I realize what I had was too intellectual. I need to simplify it. And you know, the thing that athletes all struggle with is sexuality. So quite often I teach on marriage or lust or pornography or uh, waiting sexually. And I've done this for the last four years. Well, my wife and I were at Myrtle Beach at a minister's conference recently. And we were uh, standing on the boardwalk admiring the ocean in this big old guy, a black brother, came up and tapped me on the shoulder and says, I know you. You're that sex man. <laughs> He's got a good-looking wife and children. I, I said, uh, excuse me? And he said, you're that guy that came to our football chapel when we came down to play Carolina or Duke. You taught me about sex. I remember you sounded a lot like my grandmother. <laughs> And he said, I needed to hear what you had to say. And my wife is very grateful you taught me those things, and my children too, and I'm teaching those things to my kids. Thank you. And he shook my hand and was gone. And you stop and you just revel with the grace of God that allows you to have a front row seat at something you didn't even know he was doing. One of the interns of the study center ministry had uh, become the... Um, vicar of St. Edmunds Hall College, Oxford University, England, and he asked me to come over a few years ago. I'd written a book called A Psalm for Every Sigh, and I was supposed to preach in chapel there for a week on finding the psalms in your life. So A. Hausman, one of my favorite poets, is an Oxford Don, and kids don't like poetry today. So I, I used an A. Hausman poem. This is one of your earlier professors and students here. And I would uh, quote the poem to him. I'll, I'll just share one with you. Here's a poem he wrote about dead soldiers in Memorial Day. Here dead we lie because we did not choose to live and shame the land from which we sprang. Life to be sure. It's not all that much to lose, but young men think it is, and we were young. And I would give them a little bit of poetry and explain it, bait them with it. Then we would go to the Bible and look at a psalm. Uh, great psalms in the Bible we all know and are memorized, but none of us really have taken the time to see exactly what he was saying. And it was a wonderful week of ministry because the choir sang it in the Geneva Psalter, and then I got to preach on it. There's students there at St. Edmund's from all over the world. And after you preach, you know what they do with 
particular English aplomb, the butler comes and takes you into the faculty room and you have a glass of sherry. And then you go sit at the high table with all the students at the low table. It's very high Harry Potter. And the professor's gathering around and we would sit and talk. And I remember one conversation got going about epistemology, the theory of knowledge. Is science the only way we know things? And I was telling him you can know something by experience or you can know it by reason, which is science, or you can know it by divine revolution, a revelation, metaphysics, or conscience, uh, or you can know it by human authority. This conversation went on three hours, and I remember one English professor, a lady, leaned forward and said, I really must go. I'm 40 minutes late from our class, and my students are taught not to wait longer than 40 minutes, and I must teach them today. She was hungry. Uh, professors are real human beings. They fear death. They struggle for meaning. And you can invite them in conversation. One of the um, ministries I've been involved in the last few years in the RTP, we have 5,000 exchange students from China at Duke State in Carolina and Central. And each year, 200 distinguished visiting Chinese professors come nuclear engineers, liturgist, um, agricultural specialist, all over the disciplines. And Dr. Peter Poon, a good Chinese friend of mine, enlisted me to be the theologian and teacher in residence with these professors. So regularly we meet and I give them a Christian worldview. Many of these professors will tell you, I am not yet a Christian but I am very curious about the Western world and this faith that has built the Western world. And so I'm here to learn. And we generally take Genesis 1 through 4, uh, the foundational formative theological book of the Bible. Who is God? Why does he matter? What is man? What's right with him? What's wrong with him? What is sin? What is God doing about it? I remember Francis Schaeffer used to point to Genesis and say, if you don't master the book of Genesis and understand it, you can't understand the rest of the Bible. If you don't start right, you can't end right. So we're trying to give them the formative narration of, of Genesis. Each year, these 200 professors go back to China and become the chairmen of the department of the great universities across that land. Um, Peter asked me to make a 10-year commitment, and at my age, that's a great leap of faith. But I agreed to it, and my wife said, say, what? Well, there's 600 professors back in China now that we've, we've taught. Many of them have been Christi become Christians and been baptized. Uh, last year, tomorrow's the anniversary of a two-month trip I took to China with our team. There are five of us. Uh, they're all Chinese people who speak the language. I'm the weak link. But in the academic world, you don't need to know Chinese language. You can teach in English. And we went to six universities and lectured at each one for a week. Our goal is to have 2,000 professors back in China at the end of 10 years that can understand Christian theology, many who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We go over to visit them, to encourage them. They meet us at the airport. They put us up in homes. They feed us incredible dishes. I've eaten alligator, mulberry worms, snake. Um, I drew the line at chicken feet and pigeons. I just couldn't do it. Well, as we close, I want to offer you Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been running from campfire to campfire, eating the bread of this world, and you're hungry for more. Maybe you've been inoculated against real Christianity. God is choosing you, and he's calling you to respond. He's helping you do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And where you sit, you can be that person that I was years ago as a schoolboy. Why not, he asked. And you can surrender your life and say, why not? Yes. Christianity begins when you say as yes to as much of Jesus Christ as you can comprehend. And it continues 
when you submit as much of yourself to Christ and his spirit as you comprehend. But it doesn't end there. You're taught more of who God is and more of who you're not. And you continue in the process of affirming the new things God teaches you about himself and Christ and affirming the things that are still wrong in your life and beginning to let the Holy Spirit cleanse them from you. This is the big business of God. And it's the great team he's choosing up. And I hope you can be a part of it. Nothing in this universe has satisfied me more.